welcome, welcome to the Premier League Proven Podcast. I'm your host, Jeff, with my co-host and brother, Kevin. And today we're going to talk about a team that is legendary, has been a huge part of English soccer for many decades now, for a long time, had the most Premier League titles in the English game. This is a team that I think everybody that watches this sport respects in some way, fears in other ways, and it's a team that is really at the top of the barrel when it comes to famous teams, and that is Liverpool Football Club. Uh, Obviously, they are from Liverpool, England. This is a club that has a huge media presence. I'd say, other than Manchester United, it probably is the most well-supported and quote-unquote biggest club. And when we say biggest, it kind of combines all of the different aspects of what a club is. It's so that's popularity, how much they've won, the fan base, having legendary seasons, players, a lot of accolades, all those types of things go into what makes the club great or big. Uh, But Liverpool is right up there, probably with Manchester United, who ironically are their biggest rivals, potentially outside of Everton, depending on who you ask. So Liverpool, they come from Liverpool. It's a town up in the northwest of England, pretty close to Manchester. It was for some time at now, I don't, I'm, I don't have my English history uh, down super pat here, but for some time it was one of the biggest cities in England and known for uh, having a, dock, a big dockyard, big shipping place, a strong connection to Ireland because it's on the western coast of England. And it was supplanted at some point, partly by Manchester and partly as the economy changed. But Liverpool, you can describe it as a blue-collar town. To compare it to cities in the u.s it you know philadelphia immediately jumps out and strikes me as somewhat of a a comparable comparison and uh or a comparable city it's a blue collar town it has a working class background and they are absolutely psycho about soccer and sports in general but soccer dominates there it's a it's very much city of two clubs liverpool and everson are both incredibly well supported and both are very famous english clubs they obviously have a rivalry with each other, and they contest the Merseyside Derby, which is named that because the River Mersey runs through Liverpool. So what do you think, Kevin, when you think, when someone says Liverpool football clubs to you, what, what jumps to mind? I think the first thing that jumps to mind, this is just kind of what you're talking about, is passionate fans. I think some of the most iconic songs and iconic images that you see of English stadiums I think of Liverpool, I think of all these fans sitting in the cop, holding up their scarves, singing, you'll never walk alone. And, you know, if you're a fan of the team or if you're a fan of a rival, you still have to respect the passion and how much those fans care about that team. And then the other two things that kind of jump into mind are European success. Uh, For whatever reason, they are always successful in Europe in the Champions League. It just seems like they have figured that competition out uh, are always the conversation, no matter what their league form is like. And then finally, I think consistency. I think over the last 10 years or so, we've seen a lot of the other quote-unquote big six teams kind of fluctuate, you know, either getting close to winning a league and flirting in and out of those Champions League positions. Except for last year, Liverpool has always kind of been up there in those Champions League positions guaranteed. And if not just in those Champions League positions, kind of fighting a lot of times recently city for the title just like you said when somebody mentions liverpool obviously they're manchester united's biggest rival and so i have a lot of kind of antipathy towards liverpool as a club and and in general but i think united and liverpool that rivalry has always made supporting both of those teams more fun it's it's made it a lot more uh interesting and passionate to follow both of the teams and just those big clubs having that kind of huge rivalry because it probably is the biggest rivalry in England really adds a lot to supporting both of those clubs because it's just such an important game to no matter how well or poorly the team is playing you just can't lose those games but yeah I mean the Liverpool fans I think are probably the most famous part about them you have those big European away nights or or home nights that just like you were saying it's one of the most famous things in Europe to have them belting out You'll Never Walk Alone, or YNWA, if you ever see that written out, that's what it stands for, which is, I think, like a pop song or something from the 70s, 80s. I don't know when they started that, but it's uh, somehow they've they've uh, adopted that into kind of a catchphrase for the club to basically say that we will always support the team, we will always support each other, 
And that comes in the context of this is a club that has gone through two huge tragedies, which is the Hillsborough and Hazel disasters. Those are, especially the Hillsborough disaster has left a lot of trauma, both from the incident, um, as well as all of the aftermath where Liverpool fans were blamed. And then 20, 30 years later, were exonerated. But that has left a kind of historical impact and trauma on the club that I think has built the fan base together. And when you take that in conjunction with the fact that Liverpool, and again, we're diving into English politics, but the the way that I understand it is Liverpool as a city uh, very much did not do well uh, in the Margaret Thatcher era. She is not well liked uh, up in Liverpool and Liverpool has always been more of a socialist town, has those types of very strong uh, left-leaning politics. And they've always felt like England has almost left them in the dust, forgotten about them. There's a lot of individual pride in cities in in England in a way even above and beyond what we see in the U.S. Liverpool has always felt like they were kind of an outsider. And so to be part of Liverpool, they have so much pride in the city itself. And by extension, because the both Everton and Liverpool represent the clubs or represent the city, they have so much pride in representing Liverpool and representing the people in their communities. Weird anecdote, and I don't know if I've ever told you this, my youth coach uh, is from Liverpool, a diehard fan who you know used to go to the games all the time, and you can tell how much the Hillsborough disaster really left an impact on him because he was at the game, and every single year you know, I see a pop-up on my Facebook feed him putting out a message of counting the event. And I think exactly like you're saying, it was even a bigger deal when those Liverpool fans were exonerated for, you know, it's not their fault. 97 people perished in this terrible, terrible disaster. Uh, Obviously that's a single data point. The man is more, loves Liverpool and cares about soccer more than anybody I know. And he is just a diehard fan that posts about them nonstop. Yeah, and Liverpool really got their big start at least in terms of really racking up the titles in the 70s and 80s that was when Liverpool really dominated English football those you know 20 or so years um, with Bill Shankly Bob Paisley they had so many incredible players Liverpool was the wrecking ball of English football and they also made their mark on European football I think they have six Champions League titles and I think they won four of them and around that time they won the league extremely off and Liverpool kind of carried on a lot of that dominance and became just a a national force Liverpool faded hard though in the 1990s and 2000s so the 90s and, and 2000s were all dominated by Manchester United so when Alex Ferguson took over Manchester United he said that his goal was to knock Liverpool off their perch. And the reason for that was because Liverpool had 18 titles. They'd won the league 18 times, and Manchester United had only won it seven. And they were obviously huge rivals. And Liverpool was known as the top of the game. They were the historical great team. By the time Sir Alex Ferguson left, Manchester United had eclipsed their rivals uh, and reached 20 titles. And basically from 1992 to like, 2016 or so and we're going to talk about what kind of happened 2015 2016 Liverpool was basically at their lowest point in any time in the modern era they didn't win any titles they didn't win a single Premier League title in that time they rarely even got close I believe they finished second twice famously in 2007 2008 they had an incredible team then with uh, Fernando Torres Steven Gerrard Mascherano Xabi Alonso Um, These are all really famous players, and that team kind of fell just short to Manchester United. And then famously, they also had a a team with Brendan Rodgers, Steven Gerrard at the end of his career, and kind of Luis Suarez at at the peak of his powers, who you may remember as biting multiple guys. And he also had a famous handball against Ghana in the World Cup. But Liverpool as a whole was basically in their kind of banter era. They They were in some ways... A joke. They basically always had terrible decisions after terrible decisions being made from the top. They were poorly run. They picked the wrong managers. They bought terrible players and they didn't have any money to spend, partly because they were owned by Hicks and Gillette. And I think it's Gillette, the best the man that can get of that guy of, uh, of the razor fame. And they basically ran Liverpool into the ground, bankrupted the club. From what I remember, Liverpool was basically like 24 hours away from 
kind of folding and going under as a club. You got to get that big raise your money in your teams. It's crazy that those teams didn't end up winning uh, a lot of stuff. It's kind of similar, but kind of what you see Spurs in their kind of recent era with Kane. It's like Fernando Torres and Luis Suarez were outrageously good. Uh, of course, Suarez has a, a little bit longer of career, but Torres at that Liverpool team for about two or three years was the best number nine on the planet and was just absolutely unreal. And it always hurts a little bit more when you have some of those players and you aren't able to capitalize. It just kind of makes it hurt a little bit more. Yeah, they never quite had the money or kind of the luck to put together at least good players around them. They had some of the best players in the world, but they were surrounded by average players. And when you were trying to compete against Manchester City, Manchester United, Chelsea, those were those tended to not be enough. But they were ended up being bought by John Henry, who owns the Red Sox uh, in Major League Baseball. And he tried to bring in a kind of uh, money ball approach. Who better to have a money ball approach than someone who owns the Red Sox? I think his actual funding group is going to be FSG, which I think is like the Fenway Sports Group. They were kind of some of the best in analytics. And I think we've talked about this a few times on different episodes, how soccer specifically, well, one, is hard to kind of quantify things because the sport is so fluid. But two, it probably lags a little bit further behind than some other sports, specifically American sports. And so it's an interesting approach to see a, a baseball sporting group kind of come in and try their hand at Liverpool. And it, it really did pay off. And I'm curious to see if, you know, Todd Bowley at Chelsea, who's another American who owns the Dodgers, is kind of trying to copy a little bit of Liverpool's homework to see if they can kind of turn into a successful era. My only point of contention with that is we'll see if it actually pays off and works after the certain guy that they hired at the time leaves, if he ever does. And just like we didn't only want to talk about Pep Guardiola during the Manchester City podcast, it's hard to not talk about Jurgen Klopp as the guy in Liverpool Football Club because he has basically been the the guy to bring them back from the ashes, bring them into national, international prominence, and turn Liverpool into one of the most feared teams in the world and a team that has reclaimed its place. And if it weren't for Manchester City, would for the last five years be known as one of the best teams to ever play in England. And that is Jurgen Klopp, a German guy who has the most ridiculous fake teeth other than Bobby Firmino. And uh, I think he's had a few hair transplants too. They are like glowing in the dark. It's like when you uh, go into somewhere that has black lights and someone has stain on your shirt and it glows bright white. That's his teeth all the time. And I'd be terrified to lose my eyesight if he was under a black light. He's got big chompers. He's like uh, he's like a Cheshire cat or something. But uh, Jurgen Klopp, if and I think this is the best way to describe it. I think Jurgen Klopp described it. I think somebody once commented in an interview, asked him, Pep Guardiola kind of plays this perfect concerto. He is a director. They play perfect classical music, the violins over here all the woodwinds over there, everything in perfect sync, everything as it should be, and it's beautiful. What kind of football does Jurgen Klopp play? He responded that he plays heavy metal, and really they do play heavy metal. They play a gegenpressing style. He really brought this kind of German gegenpressing style, and what that is is full flow, basically turning defending into attack, running at the other team, attacking them while they have the ball to try to turn it over and get it for yourself because those are the most dangerous times in uh, in soccer and, and lead to the most goals. If you've ever played soccer and you've played with people that are just better than you and you feel like when you're on the ball, you don't have enough time to pick your head up, you don't have enough time to make decisions because there's always somebody on you, that's kind of the idea of gegenpressing. pressing, except professional footballers are obviously very, very good at soccer. So the only way to make them kind of feel that same way is to swarm them immediately to try to win that ball back. So that's the whole point of it. It's when players from the other team are trying to get control of that ball, they're initially getting ready to transition from not having the ball to having the ball. You swarm them so they can't pick their head up. They can't pick out that pass, and you kind of snuff out the counter before it starts, and then you turn their counter into your counter and your way on goal. But it's like super, super risky because 
when it works, it's brilliant, right? Like I think what Klopp has that famous saying that winning the ball back is better in the counterattack than you know any other attacking player in the world or something along those lines. And it's absolutely true. So if it works out, great. You have the other team in this weird transition period. But if it doesn't work out, you now have maybe three players that are out of position. And that means that the other team can pick out a pass to a couple of players that are unmarked. Well, and I think if you watch soccer now, compared to even maybe seven years ago or something, every team almost presses now, except for maybe your Luton Towns and things like that. But teams like Brighton, teams like Bournemouth, teams like Brentford, Every team, including almost every top team, presses like crazy. Everyone is almost sprinting at other teams. I think a long time ago, you know, even 10 years ago when you were watching soccer, a lot of teams defended deep in their own half because that is the most defensively stable. It's the most kind of solid way to defend. But pressing really evens the odds. So whether or not you are a team that doesn't have as many good players as the opposite team, pressing can be a way to regain equality or create chances just like you said when the tactics of pressing can basically be better than any player can really be uh you can love equal out the talent advantage and when you take a team like liverpool that also has really great players and you add all of that tactical pressing in there as well that's really necessary now it's not just something that some teams do that is a necessary piece to take any team to the next level I think it fits so well with that kind of heavy metal analogy where it's this kind of style of chaos. It's playing these kind of long balls. It's getting people, it's playing balls that are, you know, at times can be viewed as risky because it's okay if you end up losing the ball. You end up turning that loss of possession into potentially a counterattack. Yeah, and when you see pressing done not well, which, you know, teams like Manchester United now and other teams don't do very well, it looks terrible. It's embarrassing. Because you really need to press as a team. If one guy just starts sprinting and another guy, it's really easy for these guys to just pass around him. So you have to press that guy and then take away all of their options. And if you that is not done well, your team will literally just fall apart at the seams. And so sometimes you can see that happen when with for whatever reason, if the press isn't working that day, some guy is not playing well, is not mentally there, making some mistakes. Pressing is a high risk strategy, but it's almost something that is a necessary part of the game today. And it's hard to envision a team really being good in the Premier League uh, without kind of having that great pressing. Uh, defending built in it really does make for entertaining soccer and exciting games because you're just getting these moments these drastic change of possessions that either you're going to have a scoring opportunity or you're likely to give up a scoring opportunity to the other team so it kind of is similar along the lines of we're going to try to outscore your our attack is probably going to be better than yours so i think we'll convert our chances better than you will like you said i i think one of the big things with this style of pressing it really it works better in the modern day game is because just like any sport that you watch athletes are what i like to think as weaponized in a way they have the perfect nutrition plans they have sports scientists with them all the time trying to get the little bit extra you know min max out of each and every player and so it kind of allows these guys to be in such better shape than what you saw you know 10 or 15 or 20 years ago where the dude is you know probably at the pub the night before slugging down some beers and then he's like oh yeah i guess i gotta get up for the game tomorrow morning so yeah i think it the modern player the modern athlete allows for his style of pressing yeah you can't smoke cigarettes at halftime anymore just such a shame unless you're in italy or turkey still okay no freedom anymore, you know. <laughs> uh, uh, but uh, when you look at, so, you know, we uh, it's a bit simplifying, I think, to say that Pep Guardiola kind of focuses on possession and attack because they all do the, everything. Manchester City is obviously one of the best pressing teams in the world as well. But this kind of using defending as a, as a point of attack, that is more Klopp style. It's more of a counterattacking, fast, aggressive, really attacking style basically lightning punches, kind of a blitzkrieg style, which I guess fits for the Germans. And uh, while Pep Guardiola is more of a boa constrictor, you know, anaconda squeezing the life out of you style. And it took a little bit of time for Jurgen Klopp to kind of rebuild the team because I think the finances just were, the finances for Liverpool have never been up to the level of a Manchester United um, or Chelsea. They've 
their American owners are not the kind of Roman Abramovich type owners that they basically, and this is limited Liverpool in a lot of ways, um, and prevented them from basically being able to truly compete with Manchester City every year. Kind of the stars have to align. And it's because they, they don't have, they basically have to spend only what they kind of take in. Um, the owner's not digging into their pockets to fund the team. And they want to basically have a really self-sustainable model that's always going to never put them at jeopardy of having big negative financial losses, even in years like COVID years and things. So that has limited Liverpool's ability to go into the transfer market. But because they've been so successful, when you re do really well in the Champions League, you get a lot of money. And so Liverpool in 2018, 2019, they are on the back of a huge drought uh, of no Premier League titles since I believe 1992. So, you know, it's it's getting towards three decades, which for a, a club of Liverpool's side is, is unheard of. They get 97 points in 2018, 2019. 97 points may, you know, that if you're new to soccer, that may not be a huge deal to you. 97 points is utterly ridiculous. You only play 38 games in a season, and if you won every game, um, which is essentially impossible, you'd have 114 possible points. So they get 97 out of 114 possible points, and they still don't win the league because Pep Guardiola and Manchester City are just that ridiculous. That doesn't discourage them. They end up going to the Champions League final, and they win the Champions League. And I think, just like you said, Liverpool has always been a team that won the has done well in the Champions League, has had famous European nights, especially at Istanbul in 2005 is probably the most famous Champions League final in history where they come back from three goals down at halftime to beat an AC Milan team that is just literally stacked with like all-time greats. But they used that second-place finish in the Premier League with the Champions League title victory and they come back in 2019, 2020, and they're the first team that kind of knocks Manchester City off of the top rung. Um, they get 99 points that year, which is just truly absurd. And that team literally just like absolutely shredded people. Sadio Mane, Mo Salah, Bobby Firmino. This is a team, this is the first time that kind of the defensive line with Allison and Nett, Virgil van Dijk, Trent Alexander-Arnold, Fabinho, Andy Robertson on the left. This is a team that literally conquers the world. When you look at what most teams want to be, I think most coaches realize that they can't really replicate what Pep Guardiola does. But I think a lot of managers probably look at Jurgen Klopp's team and take a ton of lessons from how that team played, how aggressive they were, how do they just blitzed, attacked, tackled you. They had everything that you pretty much want and were probably the most exciting team to watch because every game, there's it's just high intensity, sprinting it everywhere, everyone and everything. And it's, it's just a, a really fun team to watch unless you're a Manchester United fan. In 2020 and 2021, they ended up finishing third. It was an off year. That was kind of the COVID bounce back year. Oh, and that 20, that reminds me that 2019, 2020, the importance of winning the first Premier League title in their history, because the Premier League started in 1992 and not having won anything for like 26 years or whatever it was, the importance of that was, you know, that was such a huge moment for the red half of Liverpool. And unfortunately, COVID kind of interrupted that because uh, I believe COVID happened right at the end of this. They shut down the league, right? towards the end of the season when Liverpool had essentially clinched it. And there was some talk that they were just going to cancel the season. That was all the Manchester United fans were dying laughing uh, at the possibility that they would just cancel the season when Liverpool uh, was going to finally win. But they didn't end up doing it. Liverpool, uh, with no fans in the stadium, end up winning the title. And I think they had a big celebration a little bit after when things kind of opened back up from COVID. But unfortunately for them, that did put a bit of a damper on it. But that was the probably the peak um, because they've won a lot of Champions League, six Champions League, the most in England. But winning that first title again was just so huge. And then 2020, 2021, they had another incredible season. So much so that it came down to the last day, the last game of the season between, you guessed it, Jurgen Klopp's Liverpool and Pep's Manchester City. And unfortunately for Liverpool, they just didn't get quite enough out of the last day. 
and City goes on to win the league again. But this just shows you how good Klopp's Liverpool was, is that they won the league over City at least once, and they took them down to the last day of the league, which is a wild thing. We gushed over Pep last week on the Manchester City episode. So to have someone mentioned in the same kind of almost class and to give him a run for his money, it just shows you how high a caliber of a manager Klopp is and his Liverpool team was. Which kind of takes us to the current state of Liverpool, which last year was disappointing by their own kind of sense. Uh, Kind of like what I talked about before, you kind of think of Liverpool as synonymous with the Champions League. They're going to finish in those top positions. And last year, for the first time in a long time, they actually finished outside the top four and are outside of the Champions League, which just feels like the competition feels wrong without them in there. Um, So what do you really think happened with Liverpool last year where they didn't quite look as much as title contenders as they have in the past? So I think a lot of that plays into Liverpool's lack of money and or at least a lack of ability or willingness to spend it on uh, on the part of the owners and basically lacking a little bit of that forward thinking as well. Uh, they were due for a refresh. I think their midfield aged out a lot faster than they anticipated and so did their defense. So when Liverpool was conquering the world, a big piece of that was they had an incredible attack. Mo Salah is the best right winger in the world and has been for five years. If you don't count Messi as kind of a right winger, he puts up huge gold numbers every season. He is the talisman of that team. He is, and there's not that many good right wingers in the world. So Mo Salah is essentially invaluable and one of the best players in the world and has been for a long time. So he was a fundamental piece. They had a great attack with Sadio Mane on the other side. Bobby Firmino did uh, some decent work up top. And then their midfield was always really rugged. So they had, they didn't really have as much creativity there, but they had Fabinho, uh, Jordan Henderson. They bought, they had Wijnaldum who ended up going to PSG. So they had kind of a, a glittering attack, a workhorse midfield, and then an incredible defense in almost every way. So Van Dijk was the best center back in the world at some points. Allison is probably the best keeper in the world or in the top three. Trent Alexander-Arnold is like David Beckham, but from the right back position. And it, Andy Robertson is an incredible left back. The team aged out a lot faster than I think anyone really expected. Van Dyke, I think he's already 31, I think. Uh, and he's I th- uh, a little bit, he's getting a little bit leggy. I don't think he's quite at his, where he was in terms of literally the best center back in the world. I think he's just one of the best center backs in the world now. And, he has not been quite at the levels that he had previously reached. And then you look at Andy Robertson's getting a little older, the partner for Van Dyke. So his center back partner, whether that was Joe Gomez or Joel Matti, both of them have not really truly lived up to expectations. Matip in large part due to injury. Same with Gomez, to be honest. Trent Alexander-Arnold, people kind of figured out that he's much more of an attacking player from right back than a defending player. And teams have learned to kind of exploit that and then you look at their midfield Fabinho got too old and too leggy Henderson got too old and probably too leggy they sold both of them actually this summer and Wijnaldum they had sold a couple years prior to that and so combining that with Sadio Mane leaving the team got old quickly and so they really needed to rebuild and James Milner and Nabi Keita neither of them are really you know huge pieces of the team or at least kind of built core building blocks and so they really had to rebuild the midfield. Um, they tried to do that this year with uh, Dominique Soboslai, Hungarian midfielder who kind of is a all box-to-box but also creative type player, um, as well as Alexis McAllister, one of the many Brighton players that end up getting bought. Uh, they also bought Ryan Gravenberch and Wataru Endo as kind of backup midfielders. But now the team is constructed in such a way where I don't think that the team that it's currently built can kind of hit those highs as they had before because they don't quite have I think the pieces in every area but their attack they have five attackers that are on par with any group of five attackers on any team in the world and that's Mo Salah who holds down that right wing and then Luis Diaz and Diogo Jota they kind of alternate and and can play all across the the attacking line. Darwin Nunez, who they spent a ridiculous amount of money on uh, as the center striker, he's young and kind of the the taller guy, the the classic number nine. 
And then Cody Gakpo, who's also a young Dutch player who can also play in multiple positions across the attack. So Klopp's preferred formation has always been kind of three players up top that has, which is why they had those three up top with three kind of more workmen like midfielders to have a balance there. They're trying to recreate that balance. And I think it's just going to take a little bit of time for the midfield to rebuild itself. And then they're really going to have to figure out exactly how they want to play Trent Alexander Arnold. Do they use him in kind of a box formation at, where he's almost like a utility defensive midfielder because he can't defend well enough as a right back? And what are they going to do as Andy Robertson gets older and as Van Dyke kind of gets older? So I think they have a lot of questions to answer in the defense. The, the midfield buys that they've made seem decent, but I think they're still looking for a real true defensive midfielder. And and so this team is still in a rebuilding phase, but they have so much power from an attacking standpoint up top that I think they're still going to be at the top end of the Premier League and obviously having Jurgen Klopp there. I think the question has always been, how long is Jurgen Klopp going to stay at this job? In his two previous jobs, he did an incredible job. That was at Mainz in Dortmund in uh, Germany. Uh, he put Jurgen Klopp is like the guy who put Dortmund on the map. So when you see Dortmund in all the Champions League and things, Jurgen Klopp is... They were a famous team before that, but he brought them back from mediocrity into that elite level again, and is probably the second best team in Germany. That's all Jurgen Klopp and really where he made his name. But he had only spent seven years at both of those clubs, I and mean, now he's pushing on to his eighth year and kind of whether or not he was willing to kind of invest himself because he commits all these managers, him and, and Pep and everything. They get, they, they have the... Per- Clivity, I think, burn out more than like any other profession in some way because they just put, invest so much of themselves, so much of their time, energy, just everything. It's just such an up and down season. Even when you're the best uh, managers and on the best teams in the world, there's just so many bad things that happen. It's a really long season. It's essentially never ending. And the fact that neither of them has quit, even though they've been there for seven, eight years, speaks, I think, to the setups that Liverpool and Manchester City has built around them, knowing that these guys are literally not replaceable. They will, neither of these teams, I think, will have as good of a manager as Klopp or, or Gordial in the next 50 years. When we talked consistency with City and Liverpool, I mean, obviously it's due to these two managers that are probably the best in the league. When you look at the other big six teams, I think every single one of those teams in the last 10 years has gone through at least three managers, if not more. So it is going to be very interesting if he's kind of willing to commit to this full rebuild because it does seem like they're kind of at the start of a new cycle of this team and trying to instill these new players uh, onto Klopp's kind of style. And it'll be interesting to see if he's really willing to fully commit and dedicate his time to bringing this team uh, back up to that top level or if Liverpool don't quite hit success immediately if he's going to start looking towards the door or towards a new project so we'll, we'll see um it'll be interesting my guess is he'll probably stay there for at least another couple of years uh, and you know reevaluate. just a quick thing on Klopp that I think uh you said that definitely needs to be harped on when we're talking about his style of chaos heavy metal it's almost a throwback to uh, old school English soccer of the 80s where you're lumping the ball up and having these exciting players get after it, it fits the personality of the city of Liverpool so, so well, right? This blue-collar town, there's so many teams that have a kind of style or their quote-unquote club DNA, and it just means so much more, and the team pulls so much harder and does so much better when the manager kind of seamlessly connects, seamlessly embodies that kind of club style. And Jurgen Klopp, is the city of Liverpool when it comes to his style. And he's one of these managers that you would love to have be your manager. But personally, I I don't love playing against Klopp. If he wins, it's fine. But he is probably the sorest loser in the entire league. Uh, famously, a few weeks ago, uh, when a absolutely questionable VAR decision happened where it was a miscalled offside with the, the whole check complete controversy and he goes on tv and says yeah we we should replay the entire game when that was just one moment in the 30th minute so it's just stuff like that where if he's winning and if he's your manager you love to see him 
uh, if he's on the other team or if he's losing, he's kind of a little bit. Yeah, I mean, the thing is none of these guys are good losers. I think some people would argue that you don't want them to be. Fergie was awful at losing, um, always blamed the media. I think he shut the BBC out and didn't interview them for a long time because they didn't. They like said some bad things about his son when he was a manager. They basically said he's doing a bad job when he was doing a bad job. I think there might be a little bit more to it than that, but Guardiola acts up, I think, when they're not playing well. They just don't play. They pretty much always play well. But I think one of the things that we didn't really mention here is Part of the reason Klopp kind of has such a huge place in the in the market, so to speak, and is so famous and popular is because he's such an interesting character. I think he's just setting aside my Manchester United loyalties and setting aside the fact that I, th- I totally agree with you. I think he's a really bad loser and he things can go a little bit negatively if he if the team is not doing well, but. I think part of the reason why he's so loved is because he's really just fun. He's interesting. He says funny things. He makes great jokes. He's lighthearted a lot of the time. He is always laughing. He speaks in a way that's philosophical and meaningful and intelligent, but also has that grit and screams at his players and kind of feels everything just as acutely as someone who's watching at home or on in in the stands would feel it. He embodies what it means to be, I think a modern day manager more than pretty much anybody else does because he's so passionate. He's so engaged. He's so, he has his own style and philosophy and imprints that on the team. And he's so in command. And he's also just a likable kind of friendly guy that I think anybody would want to go get a beer with, hang out with. He just seems like a, a guy that someone that's fun and, and uh, nice to hang out with. So Jurgen Klopp, I think if you really asked anybody, including a Manchester United fan, what does a perfect manager look like? To me, Jurgen Klopp pretty much embodies everything that you would possibly want from a manager. And I think right now he embodies everything about Liverpool. In some ways, there's, you know, a famous saying that nobody is bigger than the club, right? And I think every club has always said that, basically saying that the club and the badge and the history is more important than any manager and any player and that the club will survive if any manager or player is moved on. That is true in a lot of ways. It's not been, Fergie was in a lot of ways, I think, bigger than the club. You've seen how Manchester United has done since he's left. And I think Pep Guardiola and Jurgen Klopp both are kind of similar in that. And the fact that they're so good, they have such big personalities and they're just so mammoth, gargantuan pieces of the game of soccer and their teams. They represent their teams in a way that it's going to be really hard to replace when they leave. But until they do and until Jurgen Klopp leaves, I think Liverpool fans are at the peak of every, this is everything that they ever wanted to see with their team. And they're really lucky that uh, he joined up at Liverpool and that Liverpool has done what's needed to, to keep him around and keep him going. So it takes us towards the end here where we're going to talk about our hope to heartbreak scale. So what are you giving as the hope and heartbreak for Liverpool? So I'd say the hope is five um, because whenever you have Jurgen Klopp, I think... The hope is always going to be way up there. Um, You expect to be challenging at the top end. The heartbreak, I think, for them is three, though. This team has been so good, but they still have only won one Premier League title and one Champions League final in the last few years, despite the fact that they've done so well in the league and the fact that they actually made three Champions League finals and lost two of them to Real Madrid. So this era, even as great as it's been, could have been so much better if Real Madrid and Manchester City didn't exist. This would be one of the greatest all-time five-year runs. And so just because even though they're in their probably what's going to be the greatest era in Liverpool history for the next 20 years, even though that's where they are right now, they still can't quite reach those heights because of the other teams around them. That makes it really heartbreaking and kind of sad uh, from their perspective. And They don't have the money to compete, and so they're always going to be a little bit of a leg behind Manchester City. So I think this is a really fun team to support. It's a team that the fan base is incredibly passionate, and 
you can't go too wrong supporting Liverpool. My only hesitation with that would be is that you're probably start if you just start supporting them now, you'd kind of be supporting them at kind of at the end of what you'd call of a golden age. Um, hopefully for from their point of view, the beginning of a new golden age. But Liverpool is a great team to support. Yeah, so I kind of have it pretty similar. I have a four for the hope, where yeah, it's such a great manager with some of the best players in the world. So there's definitely always that hope, that always belief that they do have a chance at you know performing well in the league. And I think being in the Europa League this year, you know, it would be a disappointment if they don't win it themselves. And then I think I'm also gonna give a four for the heartbreak where there's something that's like so frustrating about just like you talked about where you perform so well that you, know, you get 97 points in your league and you still don't win it's almost like what else could i have done you know i i've done everything i could have we gave it it all we had an incredible historic season and it still wasn't enough so i think that's a, a heartbreak piece when sometimes you feel like you know there's nothing else i could have done you know that other team is just too good and that's really frustrating for a team that is, like you said, with one of the best managers in the world, with some of the best players in the world, and what is a current and hopefully, potentially, not the end of a golden generation. So I think that's going to wrap it up for this episode. Uh, thanks so much for listening. As always, we appreciate all of your listenership. Uh, feel free to reach out to us on any of our socials. We, I think we're on Facebook now, Instagram. Uh, you name it, we are probably there. So reach out to us. Let us know if, what you like about the episodes, what you don't, if there are any topics that you'd like to hear about. And thank you so much for listening. Signing off.